Thanks to everybody for attending. Today, I want to I want to spend some time reflecting on what we're seeing in the games ecosystem in general and the observations around what players are actually doing. Talk about the archetypes that we, we see and how your game design can cater to those archetypes and a lot of the tools that we have that allow you to connect with them. So, um, you know, when I re before I prepped for this talk, I, I spent some time actually like watching people play games. It turns out great opportunity is to work with many of you, but also to get to see people play all the fun stuff that you make. And some observations are this. Mobile games, by and large, are still, on average, a very single-player experience. You know, this is a portrait of a, of a child sitting on a couch, staring into a screen, you know, very single-player, lonely type of experience. And whatever, you know, the little girl or little boy is playing, I promise you, they, they, they won't remember a year from now what they, what they were playing. And, that, and that's a weird kind of phenomenon for me because when I reflect on the games of, you know, say the 80s and 90s, I remember like playing with friends, I remember playing with families, I remember running into random people at arcades and, and, and enjoying a very social experience. Um, in the console biz, we created, you know, this kind of gamer archetype, right? It's, it's the guy sitting in his basement, you know, staring at a screen with a controller in his hand. And if we put a headset on this, this, this gamer persona, we would, we call that social. Um, but if you've, if you've played on those types of experiences, that experience is, you know, usually involves some 13-year-old screaming something about your mother. Um, and that's not necessarily the best, the best experience. And so it's, we, we, we did a little better. Um, and then there was briefly this, um, there was this phase in, so in gaming that we, we called social gaming. We were all very excited at the possibilities of bringing people together. Um, but I, I don't know how you feel, but on an, I never had the day where sending a putty knife to my friends was, was, was a fun experience. Um, and, and it just turns out we see less of those types of games today as a result. Um, so the reality is that games are better than this, right? Like when we look at, just, ignore video games for a moment, we, we know that games have the capacity to bring people together in a way that other types of mediums, other types of entertainment are not capable of. And there's evidence around us, you know, when you, when you just take a look. So, you know, I, I quote Greek philosophers to get immediate street cred, you should too. Um, Plato, you know, uses this quote, where you can discover more about a person in, you know, an hour of playing a game with them than you can in a year of conversation. It's, there's a profound statement there that perhaps unlike any other kind of medium, you can connect with people in a deeper way with games than you can with any other, other action you can think of. Uh, a, more, a more academic version of this is by a, 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 a Dutch historian, a guy named Johan Huizinga, if I can say, pronounce that correctly. Um, and, and, and in this quote, what, his thesis of his, of this, the seminal book, the book's called um, Homo Ludens, which is, if you're a Latin speaker, that loosely translates into man at play. And the thesis of the book is, is that playing in its own right helps develop us in ways that are more fundamental to the person, the pers person that we are. It shapes our, our personalities, it shapes the relationships that we create, it even shapes the way that communities come together and even like at, a, at a, a meta level, the way nation states kind of work with each other. So all play, because we're attracted to playing with each other, has meaning in, in that sense. So it's a very profound kind of way of looking at it. And what those, what those quotes are really supposed to demonstrate is that playing games are fundamental, together are fundamentally a human trait. We build friendships around them. We express ourselves through them. We build a sense of belonging to a community when we, we engage in those types of experiences. And if I, again, you know, use, let's say, the physical world as a barometer for this, like, there's some obvious examples here. You know, I, I investigated retiring. It's actually fantastic, I think. I'm going to skip the whole work thing and skip to retiring. Uh, but they're, they're constantly playing games, right? And they're, they're, they're card games and board games and anything they can get, get, get their hands on. And it's not merely, they don't just merely do it to pass away time. The, the underlying tone here is it's really to help groups of people meet each other. And, and you wouldn't otherwise not know who, these, who this other person is, you know, in this retirement community, but you, you build a relationship through games. Games also have the capacity to get large groups of people to do really inane things. This is a, this is a picture of, um, so in the Northeast United States, you know, there's Wall Street in, in New York, and it turns out, you know, there's a neighborhood of people there. 
And every year at Christmas, they, they get together and do, do this annual freeze ta tag event. And so if you know what the Northeast is like in the United States, there it gets actually pretty cold, uh, but, but somehow they get hundreds of people out in the community to come and play freeze tag events because the, it's compelling to come and play with a lot of people. Um, this is also a good, good example of, of a physical world. At, at MIT, they have this annual mystery hunt they've been running since the, the 1980s. And I think in the last version, they, uh, they had about 2,000 participants with teams ranging from 50 to 150 people. And the goal of the mystery hunt is you solve all these very archaic or arcane puzzles, I should say, and you eventually do solve all these riddles to learn where some hidden coin is around the campus. And the reward for doing all of this, these crazy puzzles like that involve you know, mental and, and re maybe even real gymnastics is you get to write the puzzles for next year's event. Um, and, and you see this graph here where it just shows the intensity of the teams that are participating in this solving puzzles you know, over a time series. And it, it, it captures like that, that, that the essence of like large groups of people coming together to experience a really fantastic entertainment experience. And so the, the, the thesis is basically, you know, at, at their best, games bring us together. And, and when I look back in, you know, kind of video game history, there's really great examples of where we, we did this really well. There's, you know, the arcades of old that brought together random groups of people to play. The more, you know, recent incarnation is, is, is the barcade. This is uh, some genius decided that they'll take their love of arcades and their love of alcohol and combine them into one establishment. Um, and so, so that, that, that I, I'm glad to see that kind of take a resurgence. But living room multiplayer games, you know, we remember games like GoldenEye and a lot of like the Nintendo products of old. And of course, MMORPGs, which in my mind are really just really elaborate chat apps that have a game on top of it while you're playing it, right? And, and all of them have these similar types of properties. They bring people together and it keeps people engaged in a very deep way. So if we accept that mobile games are largely still single player experiences and playing games as human and we've been better at this before, the question is, can we change? Can we be more effective? Um, and my, my thesis is yes, uh, we can. And here's why. We, you, you heard this, this, this stat from um, Michael this morning where we have a billion active Android users. This is 30 day actives, not totals. That's a large number of active, a massive active community of people. But use this stat as, you, as your next measure here. Three in four of those users are playing games from Google Play. That might be the largest group of people playing games ever put together. And it, of course, makes Google Play, you know, the, the, the best place to grow and distribute your game in the mobile ecosystem today. But what these two stats really tell you is that really everybody's a gamer now, right? It's not a demographic in a box. It's not just, you know, 18 to 35-year-old males. Anybody can play a game because the, the device in your pocket is capable of entertainment, is such rich entertainment, and we have these cloud services that can actually connect people together in a very deep way. So the call to action to me is really clear. Let's make our game social again. Now here's the challenge. If you have a billion active users, how do you succeed in an ecosystem this large? When you only had a few million users, it became a lot easier to kind of think about, well, what kind of game am I making? How am I going to connect with them? When you get into the billions, it becomes a much harder challenge. And so this is the reason why we made Google Play Games. This is Google's game network for Android, iOS, on the web. And we announced recently that th this game network added 100 million users in, only the last six, in just the last six months alone. And that velocity, we're very confident in saying, it's the fastest growing mobile game network perhaps ever. Um, and and, and, and what's fascinating about Play Games is it fills this really unique need when you have an ecosystem this large, and that is you're creating a concentrated network of people who love playing games, and as a result, you want to be able to connect into that and get your content exposed to them. So since we launched it at Google I.O. in 2013, developers have been integrating services like achievements, leaderboards, multiplayer gifts, and newer services like Save Games and Quest to be able to enhance the retention, engagement of their games, and we know that the games are doing better with those services today. Um, more, more tangibly, though, that Play Games gets you access to very high-quality gamers, people who love playing games. 
And that's the performance edge you need in an ecosystem like we all see today. Uh, we know when we look at data for the developers who have integrated game services, and I'll take this moment to say if you have integrated them, thank you because you are the reason why we've been successful and we, 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 we love everything that you've done with game services and we want to see you do more. But tangibly, we want to make sure that the services are actually providing value. It's not just you know, something you throw into your game because Google told you to. We see these players, they play longer, they play more often, and they monetize more frequently. And that is a reason alone to make sure that you get your game connected to those users and being able to see the double-digit percentage increases we've seen in session lengths and in, 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 in duration played, and in some cases, revenue bumps depending on the types of designs that you've chosen. So this is where the, the question, you know, it's, it's not merely a question of did you integrate play games, we all know that the game that you design matters and the thematics and, and, and how you approach your, your, your users still, still works, but how do you engage you know, a billion people? So we, um, we've done a number of studies here and, and one way to think about this is, is that in this ecosystem there's, there's an openness factor for how people want to engage with social interactions. So there's people who want to do very high levels of social interaction, very low. Um, and, and so we have these three personas, right? So the, the, I'll call them the, the competitor, the completionist, and the stealth gamer. Um, and you can plot these personas kind of on that graph of social openness, right? With your competitor being kind of the, the most open to being directly competing with other people, to your completionist who's actually not very interested in, in, in competing with others, but is more interested in, in, in you know, single player type interactions. So, our comp and so, so I'll talk about these three personas in more depth. So, so the competitor is an interesting kind of persona because the, they'll, they'll engage in almost everything in your game, right? It's achievements, it's leaderboards, it's multiplayer. Um, this, is the, this is the person, they, they own every console. You know, they, they set up their social media page to brag about the achievements that they earn from any platform that they earn it on. Um, and, and, and they're really engaged in, in just, and thrive in just direct competition. Um, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we have these, these completionists, right? These are people who, they don't really like engaging in any kind of social activity. However, they, they, they thrive in progressing through your game. They want to be immersed in it. They want to accomplish all the goals that you give them. They want to see the storyline. They want to finish, every, finish everything. This is like the mobile equivalent of the gamer that you know, wanted to earn the Geometry Wars you know, million point achievement without ever dying. You know, if you remember, you know, games like Final Fantasy VIII, it, you know, there was that one summon that you could do at the end that took like two, uh, it was like a two minute video that you had to watch just to watch it, uh, watch it cast. And you had to complete every last, you know, corner and, and inch of the game to be able to earn the right or the bragging rights to do that. That's, that's this, this person and in mobile they exist. The last category here, and they're kind of in the middle of this social openness spectrum, is what we call the stealth gamer. This one's a tricky one because they're the person you ask, hey, are you a gamer? And they're like, nah, I'm, I'm not a gamer. But then when you look at them on a normal day, they're playing games every day. This is like my mom, right? She, you know, just like, no, I don't, I don't play games. But she, she's sitting there on her, on her tablet every day playing with random people. And so what we know about this persona is they will engage in social interactions, but they will do so passively. Right? The social interactions have to be quick, they have to be you know, relatively frictionless, or you have to kind of involve them in kind of like a community type of atmosphere, as opposed to making it more head-on competition or something that they would otherwise be, be frightened of. So with these three personas, we can think of the toolkits that we have with the, the games network and how we can connect you to each one of them. So we, I talked about the competitor persona. The toolkit you have here is, is an obvious one is leaderboards, and we can talk about you know, turn-based multiplayer and, and real-time multiplayer. So the nice thing about our, our, our leaderboards is we have social and public leaderboards. So public leaderboards are kind of for your hardcore audience because there's a set of people who will always compete to be number one. For the average person, they might, not be, they might never be number one, but I could be number one amongst my friends. And so what's great about your competitor is they're going to intuitively go for the top scores, but they're going to see their friend's leaderboard and say, hey, I want to compete with my friends. They're more inclined to invite them. It's more likely to turn into an acquisition for you 
And that's a fantastic reason for leaderboards to be implemented into your games. Um, encouraging your friend, the friends to be invited into the game is just another way to, to not only engage the persona, but to grow your game incrementally. Real-time multiplayer is also, if you're building a synchronous game, this is a fantastic technology that gets you into the ecosystem in a very tangible way. NBA Jam here, if you remember that game from, from the 90s, now on mobile, they implemented our, our real-time multiplayer. And what they use really effectively is what we call our auto-matching feature. And auto-matching, the way to think about it is, is you're getting access to the hidden social graph of the game. It's basically connecting people who are playing actively right now and so you see incredible boosts in engagement because you're able to simulate kind of the arcade interaction of old, but, it, but on a mobile medium. And so you'll play a game like NBA Jam, you're playing one or two sessions, you bail out, and then in seconds later you're connecting with somebody else who's available to play right now. For a more, let's say, intimate experience, you can still invite friends directly in the game, and this is kind of a screenshot of doing that. Google will sort and rank users depending on your your interaction with them recently. So recent players and active players will show up you know, at the top, and friends who haven't yet come to play the game are, are, are deprioritized in an effort to make the match experience relevant. Um, for turn-based multiplayer, it largely follows a similar type of model. Uh, obviously, turn-based multiplayer is much better for games that where the sessions can be played in increments. So you know, maybe it's over hours or over days, um, or it's just it's literally a turn-style game. Um, same type of thing, except when a turn is pending, in the games experiences that we have in the Play Games app and inside the game themselves, this is a call to action for me to come back. So if I went on vacation or I just got busy and I didn't decide to finish playing the game, having that card sitting in my inbox that says, hey, Dan, Dan's turn started, reminds me that I was playing this game and is a call to action for me to come back, and that's an important retention mechanic for you. An important part of, of, of turn-based in real time, though, is, is the social discovery part of it. And, and that is, when somebody invites me, I do get a notification across the entire Android ecosystem. So the, the way that this works is, is we, we prioritize how noisy the notification is, depending on whether I have a connection with them in their circles or whether I don't know them at all. So here you can see, you know, Dan's invited me on, on the left here. And I see his face, and I see his name, and it buzzes my phone, and it, it, it vibrates, and great, Dan's there, I'm gonna go and play a game. But somebody can invite me who's not in my circles, and I'll get a silent notification in the shade, and when I pull that down and I look at it, it's like, okay, great, I'm gonna go see who invited me and understand if I wanna play with them. So when I dive into one of those notifications, you'll get this, an experience not dissimilar to this, which basically allows me to start a game with somebody I know, Dan on the left, or somebody I don't know, this stranger on the right, not really a stranger. Um, and, and I can decide whether I want to play with them or not or mute them or decline or whatever have you. But here's, here's the, 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 the growth hack. If I don't have the game, this will redirect you to the Play Store. And then someone's going to install your game, start getting playing that they otherwise wouldn't. And because it was introduced to me by a friend, they feel a, a lot more inclined to start playing the game because there's kind of a, a social angle to like, well, if Dan likes the game, I should like the game too. Okay. So we talked about the competitor persona. There's the other side of the spectrum, which is the completionist. The single, there's two really important ways to engage this user, and we just see it time and time again through data. Great achievement design and supports saved games. Great achievement design, you know, the way, the way I always describe it is, is, you know, if I finish a game like Hitman Go, is the game really done? And I could just turn it away and, you know, forget about it. But it turns out that when I add achievements to my game, it allows me to explain to users that there's more depth to it, that there's more to do. And so you can easily come back and you can see, you know, here's some achievements that I haven't quite finished. They're still very incremental. It gives me other types of objectives. It calls me back into the game. And we've seen games with great achievement design boost monetization. They've boosted engagement. They've retained their users in a deeper way. And consistently compared to games that don't implement achievements, they, 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 they outperform them almost every time. Um, if you want tips on good achievement design, we have a, a YouTube video it's called Game On Achievement Point Pointers. This is a good opportunity to take a picture of the screen. If you don't take a picture of the screen, you can Google it. It's a fantastic video by our resident Todd Kerpelman, who is a former um, Pogo designer. 
Uh, I mentioned saved games, so this is kind of intuitive, but you have these solo players who are increasingly, when they're very engaged, are switching between devices. Our saved game system works cross-platform. Um, and, and, and really, the, the, the point of doing this is, is you never want somebody to play level one again. If they're going to switch a device or buy a new device, the worst situation is you'll, you'll completely churn out your user if they can't pick up where they left off. Or my other favorite example, and I think we've all experienced this, is you get the support call if somebody says, hey, I, I thought that I would fix the game if I just uninstalled it or reinstalled it. Like, that works normally, right? And then you realize, oh, wait a second, you've lost all your data. You've basically reset the game. There's not very much I can do for you. That's a bad experience. Saved games completely removes this, and we consistently see this as like one of the top requests from any one of our players in play games. Easy to implement, brain dead for, for, to, for, for, from, a, from that perspective. And here's what we added at, at I.O. is the ability to attach cover images. So you'll see here, you know, this is me playing Leo's Fortune. What they do is they, they take a screenshot of where I last left off in the game. So when I come back from vacation, and I scroll through, hey, wh what game do I want to go back to? I see the screenshot that reminds me, yeah, that's right. I did left, leave off on level three. I'm going to come back and I'm going to pick that game over other ones because I feel like I could go back and, and probably win that level. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a digital bookmark that users can get called back into action and help you get a little bit more of a, a re-engagement uh, flavor to your, to your title. Um, while we're on the topic of growth hacks, I, I want to insert this one, and this is the concept of games your friends are playing. Can, th this applies really to all the personas, but I, I'll, I'll call out, because the completionist still was a uh, you know, play alone type of player, they're still attracted to this. There's something that's about, hey, let me see what my friends are playing. It's a way for me to discover games. It's a, it's a denotion of like maybe the games have higher quality or whatever have you. So you see a screenshot here. We have the Play Games app where you can see games that I've played recently, like Brave Frontier or Frozen Front, or in the store where you can see you know, games like Heroes of Camelot and Sky Force. This is a, a very strong call to action. It's zero effort to you other than implementing Play Games. We take the signals, we pour them into our discovery channels and help your game get better discovered. And so if you're into growth hacks, finding those extra percentage points of additional user acquisition, this is a very easy thing to, to do for your game. OK, and so it brings me to the stealth persona. So we talked about how the stealth persona is kind of tricky, right? They, they, they don't like the direct you know, social engagement, so you can't use like, the old you know, memes of like, direct competition. Um, they, 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 they don't think of themselves as a gamer, but they play all the time. But we have a few tools that we think have, will constantly resonate with them. So the first one is, is we created a, a game gift system. Um, that we, we know from our research that if the social interactions are extremely discreet, very easy to get into, low friction, game gifts is a way to kind of trade a quick object between two players and keep them engaged and invite them into the game. And this service is pretty simple. I, I can just kind of visual, visualize it this way is, you know, when you implement it, players select a gift that they, they send to another player. We store it for seven days on our server and we send a notification in a similar type of way that we do for multiplayer. When, when the other user receives the notification, they tap through, they select the gift that they want to play, and similar to what we did in multiplayer, we'll ask them to install the game if they don't already have it. It's a great opportunity for another social acquisition, but it's also something that resonates with this persona because it's not very, you know, kind of, it's not, I'm not getting challenged. I'm not being put on the spot to be able to do this right away. It's a very simple thing that I, oh, I'm receiving something from somebody. That sounds, that sounds kind of cool. Don't send them putty knives, by the way. I don't want any putty knives. Um, and then ultimately, they, they receive the gift, they're elated, and they get engaged into the game. And you can create the experience, recreate the experience inside of your own game like we do with any one of our other APIs. Another service that we launched is, is called Quests. And the way to think about Quests is, it, well, first of all, it's, it's a way to create time-based objectives in your game without having to update the game. Um, and what it does is it creates like this community feeling, right? Like there's, there's a lot of people doing this big kind of community event on a weekend. Um, sometimes this is referred to like live ops, so this might be thought of as live ops in a box. And, and but the way that we, we, we've, we've implemented this is it's analytics driven. And so the way Quest works is you send the Quest system events of what's going on in a game. When somebody levels up, when they you know, modify their sword, when they find the rare black sheep in your game. And 
through learning what the player what players are doing inside of the game, you can craft quests that you run in a time span, like on a weekend or for an entire week, based entirely off of that data. I'll show you how this works. So you start by defining a set of, of events that happen in your game. Let's say I'm making a zombie game and I have red, green, and blue zombies. And so I would fire an event every time somebody killed one of those three colors of zombies. Um, and I integrated that in my game and the quest interfaces that, that, that exist to show a user when a new quest is available. And then I'd monitor those events. So let's say I'm pretty satisfied with the number of red zombies and green zombies being killed in the game but I'm not really happy with the number of blue zombies being killed because there's more monetization events tied to them, they're harder to kill, people have a tendency of buying more things in my game because they're, they're, they're harder to kill in general. So I can go into the developer console and create a quest, it's like, hey, we're gonna have a 5,000 zombie blue, you know, blue zombie killing fest this weekend, and the quest system will track every time somebody's completed you know, killing an existing blue zombie, and when you accomplish that goal, it can push down a custom blob of data to your game that you can interpret and decide how you want to reward your users. So common examples would be a blob that says grant in-game currency to the, the user who succeeds or give them some kind of in-game reward or progress them through the game in a, in a new type of way. The best part about this though is I didn't have to update my game at any moment in time. It's entirely based on just sending the events and the quests automatically populate in the quest UI that's integrated. And so you could run these quests every day, every week, every weekend, and constantly re-engage your users, but use the data to decide which quests are the most effective, and are you helping shape the behavior of your users in a way that you're retaining and engaging them more. We had one developer who showed us their quest data recently, and they saw users that, that, that engaged in quests went on to do I think it was 160% more other types of sessions in their game just by virtue of, of, of engaging them in this way. So I, I highly advise, like it, it's, it's a dynamite feature if you're into live ops, um, very easy to implement and everything's documented on developers.google.com. The last thing that I want to talk about is, of course, okay, we've got these three personas, we have all these tools, how do you know you're successful? So you have to have a way to measure success. So Google. We're a very data-driven company. Game developers who are wildly successful are also very data-driven. One way that we help you here is, you know, you're familiar probably with the statistics we have in the Play Console today, but there's a separate game-focused set of statistics that are given to you just by virtue of integrating Play Games. And so when you implement Play Games, there's basically a zero effort, you know, dashboard that's given to you. I'll dive into it a little deeper. So, for example, your daily dashboard gives you a summary of your, your active users, your new users, retention, and more recently we've added demographic data. The demographic data is, when we hear from developers, is, is essential because as a game designer you want to know, hey, is this game actually resonating with the audience I thought that was going to be playing it? If I made a game that I expected, you know, females between the ages of 18 and 30 to, to play, I, I would hope my data would show that. Uh, another angle here is, is that if you're into user acquisition and you're trying to come up with the right type of creative assets, knowing what kind of demographic your game has in reality can help you decide what kind of creatives you use and how you engage and go after the right audience. Another essential here is our retention dashboard. This is for new, your ability to retain new users. Um, so, so a common you know, example here is you want to take a look at how many new users are coming back you know, day one, day two, day seven, day 30. And so you can kind of understand the attrition rate of your game. And you, let, let's say that you had a tutorial in your game and you wanted to try to improve that in an effort to help people get back on day one and day two more often. Here you would see, you know, on March 8th here, I did an update to my game the day before and I saw a boost in my metrics because apparently my tutorial was better at convincing people to stick around. And that's the use case for this data. Again, comes from just integrating play games and having people sign in. The formula? I, 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 yeah, this, this one's simple, right? It's basically you have a cohort of new users that came in on a specific day. Here's the percentage that came back day one, day two, day three. It's, it's a simple multiplier. 
Uh, the last one is in the engagement stats. Today we support achievements in leaderboards. So when you think about you know, engaging these personas, you also want to use the data to know that you're effectively doing that. So you can see whether the achievements that you added to your game recently are actually getting earned, whether they're too difficult, whether it takes too long to, to earn them. Or if you're into the, the, the competitor type of persona, maybe you have a custom leaderboard for some very special part of the game, and this is a way for you to get an indicator of whether they're actually engaged in that content and whether the changes that you're making to your game design are actually resonating with that, that, that type of user. All right, so I'll wrap up. Um, the summary today is basically this, is Google Play Games connects your game to a highly concentrated network of very high quality gamers. Uh, we have the, the services, achievements, leaderboards, multiplayer, and GIFs, and the new stuff like save games and quests. And they're all showing us data that games are increasing engagement and retention in very dramatic ways. These players play longer, they play more often, they monetize more frequently. Um, and these service ca can cater to those three personas if you're very deliberate about it in your design. But going back to the beginning of this, remember, everybody's a gamer now. We have a billion of them out there. And that makes this a much more challenging but also a very exciting time for us. Android and Google Play have created an ecosystem that large that give you that kind of opportunity. And we know that games at their best have brought us together. And so if I leave you with one message today, it's go forth and, and make your game social. And with that, if you have any questions for me, I'll, I'll be wandering outside, happy to talk with every one of you.